Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Roberto Delloro. I'm a professor in the Department of Theological Studies, and I'm also the director of the Bioethics Institute here at LMU. Uh, I want to welcome all of you who are tuning in this evening, students, faculty at LMU, but also all interested persons from the community. We are quite numerous. And that's really a wonderful thing. Our fall bioethics lecture carries the somewhat ominous title, Facing Disaster, COVID-19 and the Ethics of Pandemic. Uh, the choice of this topic was a no-brainer for us here at the Institute. COVID has been on the forefront of our ethical preoccupations as a as a community, as a country, and of course, um, a preoccupation uh, that has taken up our reflection, not just at the national, but also at the international level. Uh, let me begin with the numbers, which are staggering. According to official statistics, we have had almost 45 million infected in the world and over 1 million dead. In the US alone, which is the worst hit country in the world, the infected are 8 million and the dead over 230,000. Over the past months, the bioethics scholarly community has been engaging in reflection on a number of ethical issues triggered by the pandemic. They include issues of public health policy, for example, the ethical justification of measures for public safety, issues of clinical ethics. I think of the problem of articulating ethical criteria for rationing of resources in acute medical care settings, for example, ventilatory support. Uh, issues of research ethics and medical experimentation. How do we go about finding a vaccine? And then what are the criteria for its allocation? So in our panel discussion tonight, we will address some of these issues and we will do so with the help of our faculty here at the Institute. I will introduce Drs. Nick Brown, Joseph Rejo and Gigi McMillan shortly together with the topics they have decided to take up. So I want to offer a few introductory remarks. And uh, let me just say that those remarks are in a way considerations of a different nature. Without forfeiting the relevance of ethical reflection, which is by definition always oriented to action. I wonder whether it might not be necessary for us after all these months into the pandemic to step back and to think about the existential predicament occasioned by the COVID pandemic. If you want to think about what led us here in the first place. I start from the following premise that with COVID-19, we have found ourselves linked in an experience of globalization, which is also a common experience of contingency, a realization which has come at a high cost. That's my question. What lessons have we learned? I want to point to three lessons hoping that uh, these points will constitute a good point of entry into our conversation tonight. The first lesson is the lesson of fragility. Think about the predicament of our hospitals, which have struggled with overwhelming demands, facing the agony of resource rationing and the exhaustion of healthcare personnel. Immense unspeakable misery 
and the struggle for basic survival needs have brought into evidence the condition of prisoners, of those living in extreme poverty at the margin of societies, not only in our country, but also in developing countries. And thinking of the abandoned destined to oblivion in refugee camps from hell. The face of fragility, I think, we have seen also in the reality of so many dead. I think of those who have died experiencing the loneliness of separation, both physical and spiritual, from everybody, leaving their families powerless, unable to say goodbye, even to provide the basic piety of proper burial. Um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic in uh, the months of uh, March and April, uh, I received uh, very disturbing news from family in Northern Italy. And uh, this was the situation of family losing relatives and being unable to actually be present in the last moments. The virus reaps indiscriminately, the young, no less than the middle-aged, the strong, no less than the frail. That's the second lesson. I would call it the lesson of finitude. The second lesson of COVID concerns the limitations entailed by our conception of autonomy and freedom. I think the pandemic has sort of brought to the fore the fact that our notion of freedom, especially when it is rooted in a lifestyle of consumption and exploitation, needs revising. Here, I want to bring attention to the fact that the phenomenon of COVID-19 is not just the result of natural occurrences, though I will not dispute the natural genesis of the pandemic. Again, it's not just the result of natural occurrences. What happens in nature is already the result of a complex intermediation, if you want, with the human world of economical choices and models of development which are themselves infected with a different virus of our own creation. It is the result of financial greed, the self-indulgence of lifestyles defined by consumption and excess. Uh, I want to quote here Pope Francis in the encyclical Laudato Si and also in the latest encyclical Fratelli Tutti in saying that COVID-19 has everything to do with our depredation of the earth. It is also an ecological crisis. The symptom of our failure to care, more a sign of our own spiritual malaise. A third lesson, I want to call it the lesson of interdependence. The exercise of autonomy based on consumption and excess in the first world countries has been paid by people in the so-called global south. And here I want for your imagination to expand a little bit beyond the United States. We mourn the loss of thousands of victims, but let us not forget that malaria tuberculosis, lack of drinkable water and basic resources still saw the destruction of millions of lives per year, a situation which we have known for decades. So now we, the uh, people in the first world country come to realize that of course, we are also open to the possibility of getting infected and in fact dying, but all of a sudden we are opened up to the reality of countries for which 
millions of people dying is actually everyday uh, reality. So I think to learn the lesson of interdependence entails opening our eyes to the reality of human beings who experience the limits of freedom and self-determination in their own flesh, so to speak, in the daily challenge to survive, to secure minimal conditions for subsistence, to feed children and family members, to overcome the threat of diseases in spite of the availability of cures too expensive to afford. And here, of course, I'm also thinking about the huge economical repercussions of the COVID crisis. So our common vulnerability, our finitude, our interdependence teach us the importance of solidarity and of international cooperation. And I want to conclude with a couple of thoughts dedicated to this. It seems to me that in this context, a privileged place belongs to the World Health Organization, the WHO. I think the role of the WHO ought to be reaffirmed, especially its commitment to protect, to foster, and ultimately to make effective a universal right to the highest attainable standard of health. By the way, this is one of the items in the Bioethics Declaration of Human Rights. We have to denounce the foolishness of provincialism and the narrow-mindedness of national self-interest, which has led many countries, including ours, unfortunately, to vindicate for themselves a policy of independence and isolation from the rest of the world, as if a pandemic could be faced without a coordinated global strategy. I think the attitude of separation feeds into a logic of, uh, of separate, I'm sorry, the attitude of provincialism feeds into a logic of separation, which is self-defeating for, uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, it is less effective against a worldwide pandemic, but also it results in the widening of inequalities and the exacerbation of resource imbalances among different countries. Though all rich and poor are vulnerable to the virus, the poor are bound to pay the highest price and to bear the long-term consequences of lack of cooperation. So it is clear that the pandemic is worsening the inequalities that already are associated with processes of globalization, making more people vulnerable and marginalized without healthcare, employment, and social safety nets. Obviously, this is true also for our country. I conclude by saying that we are in this disaster together. We have been in this disaster together for a number of months. And COVID can be overcome only through cooperative efforts of the human community as a whole. And this calls for everyone's responsibility and a willingness to carry each other's burdens with an eye to the well being of all. I hope these introductory remarks might actually serve as uh, suitable reflections for the uh, considerations that will follow now. Um, I want to introduce um, our panel tonight, uh, which consists of three faculty here at the Institute. Each one of them will pick up a particular uh, topic. Let me introduce briefly the first panelist, Dr. Nick Brown, who has a doctorate in uh, Christian ethics from Fuller Theological Seminary. His work, his research focuses on philosophical and theological conceptions of justice and how these conceptions inform uh, 
public discourse on public health and the distribution of healthcare, he has chosen for his presentation the following topic, through the veil, the racial inequalities of COVID and Rawls theory of justice, a critique. Dr. Brown, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Delaro, and uh, thank you very much for your introductory remarks. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the presentations of my co-panelists, and I'm sure the rich and vibrant uh, conversation that will ensue and hope that my remarks now may make some kind of uh, contribution to that end. So uh, as Dr. Delaro mentioned, the title of my remarks is Through the Veil, the Racial Inequalities of COVID-19 and Rawls's Theory of Justice, a Critique. Given the rapidity and volatility by which events have unfolded this year, I hesitate to venture too definitive a prognosis of how American historians will look back and discuss the year 2020. Even so, I think we can be reasonably confident that two episodes in particular will stand out and occupy a majority, if not a totality of their attention. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the outpouring of public protests following a number of high profile police killings of African-American women and men. The societal significance and impact of these events are such, are such a scale that each deserves its own discrete examination. Indeed, we are now only beginning to discern and grapple with the long-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic will have on public health policy and clinical practice and medical research, as we are of how the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor will fundamentally reshape a broader public discourse on race and law enforcement. And yet, even while there are compelling analytical reasons for why we should keep our examination of these two events separate, there are, in my judgment, even more compelling reasons for why we should interpret them in light of each other. In fact, I would like to suggest that we cannot properly understand, let alone evaluate the full import of COVID-19 and the police killings of black men and women until we view them stereoscopically, that is in juxtaposition. In doing so, we will discover at least one dis disconcerting yet empirically irrefutable point of nexus, namely that the hue of one's skin still plays a decisive and insignificant role in determining whether one contracts and survives COVID-19 in the US. Uh, to wit, according to recent data collected by the Center for Disease Control, the number of positive COVID-19 cases among African-Americans, Latinos, and American Indians are all nearly three times that of whites. Furthermore, this same data shows that among those who test positive for COVID-19, African Americans, Latinos, and American Indians are all hospitalized at nearly five times the rate as whites, and that African Americans die from COVID at over twice the rate as do whites. To further underscore and contextualize, contextualize this last point even further, while African Americans comprise just over 12% of the total US population, they constitute over 21% of all recorded COVID-19 death, COVID deaths in the US. And while a fair portion of these stark differences between whites and racial minorities in COVID infection and mortality rates can be attributed to intervening variances in age, comorbidities or existing health conditions and income level, a recent study published in Health Affairs, the journal Health Affairs, found that even while controlling for such variables, black COVID-19 patients in California still required hospitalization for treatment nearly three times as much as whites. Upon rehearsing such data, it is quite natural to draw the conclusion that part of the way we should interpret the COVID-19 pandemic is to view it as generative of gross health inequalities along racial lines. And while such a conclusion is ostensibly true, it is also misleading insofar as it obscures and belies the fact that such racial inequalities were already well entrenched, well entrenched and extant well prior to the arrival of COVID-19. Indeed, setting COVID-19 aside, racial minorities in the United States have historically fared worse than whites across the board when it comes to health measurements, whether it be higher incidence of lower birth weight to an overall higher mortality rate and virtually, virtually every other major healthcare metric in between. 
Accordingly, as Samantha Artiga, Bradley Corallo, and Olivia Pham have recently observed, a more accurate interpretation of COVID-19 is not to view it as causing racial health care disparities, but rather it exposing and exacerbating, exacerbating pardon me, racial health inequalities that were already present. What guidance then might bioethics offer to how to address and remedy such racial health care inequalities? Typically, such, such questions have been subsumed under the bioethical, princi bioethical principle of justice, and more specifically, what is called distributive justice, a type of justice that focus on, focuses on the just distribution of social, political, and economic goods within a society. In this case, the, the particular good in question is health and health care, and thus bioethicists have long sought to devise a theoretical schema and policy framework whereby the good of health can be allocated to all members of a society in a manner that does not discriminate according to characteristics like age, sex, race, and of course, race. One of the most influential theories of distributive justice, not only within bioethics, but modern political philosophy more broadly, is a theory promulgated by John Rawls in his renowned 1970 work, A Theory of Justice. Often described as an egalitarian theory of distributive justice, Rawls posits that in a liberal and pluralistic society like our own, the most feasible and fair way to, e to equitably distribute social and economic goods is in compliance with two fundamental principles, what he calls the liberty principle and the difference principle. The liberty principle essentially holds that all persons are entitled to fully adequate, a fully adequate scheme of basic equal liberties while the difference principle holds that all persons should be entitled to a fair opportunity to access social, political, and economic goods with the stipulation that any resulting inequalities should always benefit the most disadvantaged. In addition to the articulation of these two fundamental principles, what also makes Rawls' theory of distributive justice so intriguing and attractive among its adherents and proponents is the process or procedure he envisages, envisages as to how these principles are to be initially defined and selected. So as to ensure that the selection of the liberty and difference principles are not corrupted by the taint of any bias or prejudice owing to being a member of a particular sex, class, race, age, or religion, Rawls proposes we imagine ourselves stepping behind a so-called veil of ignorance, wherein we shed and purge ourselves of all particular traits of our identities save for being rational, free, and morally, equally, morally equal individuals. In doing so, Rawls is confident that we cannot help but ultimately select the liberty and difference principles to ground our distribution of economic and social goods inasmuch as the selection of these two principles will ensure that all persons will receive a fair, which is to say just distribution of such goods, no matter what particular identity they eventually will assume once they step on the other side of the veil and inhabit a particular social location. As I mentioned, Rawls' egalitarian theory of distributive justice has wielded tremendous influence within bioethics, both theoretically and practically. Uh, regarding the former, that is the theoretical, Harvard philosopher and bioethicist Norman Daniels has provided one of the most robust and comprehen comprehensive accounts of how Rawls' theory can be specifically appropriated to secure a fair distribution of healthcare resources within society. And while they may not be explicitly Rawlsian in letter, there are several provisions of the Affordable Care Act regulating the private health insurance market, including guaranteed issue of health insurance, community rating, and the definition of essential health benefits that are, that are undeniably Rawlsian in spirit, insofar as they seek to mitigate the punitive cost inequalities people previously encountered on account of their age, sex, geographic location, and health status. And yet, as formative and instructive as Rawls's theory has been and continues to be, I would like to argue that it still strains heavily under the burden of two persistent problems, problems that become all the more pronounced when it comes to rectifying racial health inequalities. To state this another way, I would submit that viewing the problem of racial disparities in healthcare through a Rawlsian veil of justice cannot help but create and perpetuate two fundamental, fundamental distortions that if left unchecked will only further ensconce and perpetuate these racial disparities. 
The first of these distortions is a fundamental miscomprehension of the kind of good healthcare is. And the second problem is a fundamental malformation of the community who decides how this good, that is the good of health, is to be distributed. In the time that I have remaining, I would like to further, albeit briefly, explain the nature of both these problems as I see them. How does Rawls's theory of justice misunderstand and thus distort the kind of good health is? To answer this question, we must look at how Rawls defines what he calls, quote, primary goods. Primary goods, according to Rawls, are the things that every rational person is presumed to want. In particular, they are the things that free and equal persons need in order to live as a normal and fully functioning social member of society. Hence, the primary goods are the very economic, political, and social goods that are, be, that are to be distributed justly within a society. Rawls further refines his definition of primary goods by categorizing them according to kind or source. He considers some primary goods as natural in origin, inasmuch as their endowment and distribution are subject to the vagaries and vicissitudes of the genetic lottery, as it were, while other primary goods are social in that their provenance and allocation are embedded within and mediated by a matrix, matrix excuse me, of interpersonal and communal relationships. What kind of primary good then is health? Is it natural or is it social? According to Rawls, health is to be viewed as a natural primary good, since any individual's given health status is predominantly a function of their inherited biology and physiology, not their social location. As such, health cannot, nor should it be included among the list of social goods that are to be equitably distributed. To be sure, Rawls is certainly correct to assert that there are certain aspects of a person's health that are irreducibly natural and thus beyond the purview of social influence and control. As much as I may want to be 6'8", run a 4240, and have a 40 inch vertical jump, my genotype will have the final and authoritative word. Moreover, I think Rawls is also correct in his concern that any social program that seeks to eradicate all naturally occurring health inequalities will at some point run the inevitable and dangerous risk of per uh, perpetrating gross violations of not only excuse me, perpetrating gross violations of not only individual bodies, but also the body politic. Even so, to conceive of health as either solely or even chiefly a natural primary good is to ignore and thus diminish its intrinsic social essence in at least three identifiable ways. First, while determined and bound by some natural limitations, a person's health does not exist or operate within a vacuum Hermetically, hermetically sealed off from her or his physical and social environment. There are indeed environmental and structural determinants of health that will inexorably defect a person's health status, whether for good or for ill. Second, the provision of health and healthcare is unavoidably social in nature, whether it be in the context of a clinical encounter between a physician and patient, uh, a person navigating the private health insurance market, or a government funded and operated healthcare system, the giving and receiving of health and healthcare cannot occur save for the establishment of a network of collaborative relationships between different social actors. Finally, our very understanding of what health is, whether we want to define it as quote, good or quote, bad or natural or social, or according to any other kind of descriptive and conceptual typology is predicated upon a shared sense of language and meaning making. How we encounter and experience health, whether our own or that of another person, will always be shaped, formed, and filtered through and by the interpret interpretive lens of a communal existence and hermeneutic. Thus, in light of these aforementioned observations, I think we would be better served not to view health primarily as a natural, even a primary, or excuse me, not, uh, not excuse me, not to view health primarily as a natural primary good, but rather as Charlene Garlinau has suggested, a communal and shared good, since health is dependent on the social relations located in multiple and diverse communities. And because health is primarily in these communities that the meanings of health and healthcare are created, negotiated and shared, that people are made healthy and sick, that care is given and received, and that the benefits of health or healthcare are accrued.
If therefore we are to regard health as a communal good and not just a natural good, then according to Rawls's theory, it is incumbent upon members of a community to develop and implement a system of distribution whereby the good of health can be equally accessed. And as Rawls also insists, in order for a community to devise and institute such a system, its members must first select its founding principles by divesting themselves of any identifying attribute, save for being rational, free, and morally equal. In other words, the members of a community must select these founding and grounding principles of distributive justice, according to Rawls, largely as strangers both to themselves and to each other. This estrangement, however, exacts a tremendous price both in terms of the moral formation of those who compose a community, as well as to the formation of the community itself. For as Michael Sandel and others have observed, the extraction from all social and communal particularity renders Rawls's original choosers, those who are choosing these founding, uh, founding principles in the original position, as woefully emaciated moral agents who are ill-equipped to adduce compelling reasons as to why exactly they should choose the principles of liberty and difference in the first place, much less why they are morally obligated to abide by these principles and how they distribute social goods to their fellow citizens. Thus, what Rawls fails to appreciate is that while, the, is that while community membership does undeniably inculcate, in excuse me, inculcate particular moral commitments, it is their very particularity which diffuses these commitments with their requisite moral health, and indeed makes it possible to consider the moral status of those who may fall outside the boundary of one's given community. The significance of this last point becomes even more salient when we consider another well-known invocation of a veil or a veil trope, namely W.E.B. Du Bois uh, mention of the veil in his seminal work, The Soul of Black Folks. Of course, for Du Bois, the veil is not a mechanism by which moral agents are denuded of their partiality, but rather it is symbolic, it is symbolic of a scrupulously maintained and negoti negotiated color line demarcating whites whose Americanness is unassailable from blacks whose citizenship is continuously questioned and disputed. Thus, whereas, the full community, thus, whereas full community membership of Rawls's theoretical agents stepping behind the veil of ignorance is assumed, the long and tragic history of oppression and discrimination of African-Americans in the United States, along with the ways they are currently disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic now, demonstrates the degree to which their actual membership still very much remains an open and contested question. Hence, it is this glaring incongruity between the theoretical equality of membership in Rawls's ideal community and the historical exclusion and marginalization of African-Americans and other racial minorities in the United States that has led Charles Mills and other philosophers of color to note that what is being ignored behind Rawls's veil is not so much the particularity of membership identity as such, but rather the myriad ways in which racial minorities have been consistently and repeatedly denied the opportunity to even participate in the choosing of founding principles in the first place. In closing, I would therefore like to suggest that while that we will only begin to truly address and remedy the racial inequalities exposed and magnified by COVID-19 to the extent that the communal nature of health and distributive justice are, as it were, unveiled. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brown. Excellent, uh, excellent presentation. We are very grateful for your uh, observations and reflections. I want to introduce now our second panelist, who is uh, Dr. Joseph Rejo. Um, Joseph is, oh, I should say, Dr. Rejo is a clinical ethicist at UCLA, um, where he was also trained in the postdoctoral clinical ethics uh, fellowship, I should say the prestigious postdoctoral clinical ethics fellowship. Uh, Dr. Rejo received his PhD in philosophy uh, from the University of Pisa in Italy, something which makes me very happy and um, has worked on the staff of the President's Council of Bioethics in Washington for a number of years when uh, Dr. Ed Pellegrino was the chair of the council. Uh, Dr. Reo is also 
uh, on the faculty of the Bioethics Institute, where he teaches courses in bioethics at the end of life. Um, his talk is entitled Moral Duty to Treat Infectious Disease, Ethics, and the Physician. Thank you very much, Dr. Rejo. Thank you very much, Dr. Deloro, for that very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank all the audience members for uh, calling in and being with us. I'd also like to thank Professor Brown for a great talk, uh, which I enjoyed very much. For my presentation, I would like to examine the physician's moral duty to treat during pandemics. In particular, I will engage the following question. Do physicians have a special obligation to treat patients who are dangerously infectious, even at elevated risk to themselves and through them, others? Occupational risks abound in medicine. From serious blood and needle stick infections to respiratory um, contagion, I will focus on coronavirus. Its harms, as we know, are not insignificant. We can divide them into harms to self and harms to others. Harms to self include anxiety and psychological trauma while awaiting COVID testing results. If the exam returns positive, harms to self also encompass treatment and its associated um, side effects, hospitalization, even ICU care, inability to return to work, perhaps chronic disabilities. We're just now learning about the long-term impacts of this virus in terms of heart and lung function. Premature death. The last article I could find published at the end of the summer using data from mid-May identified more than 500 physician deaths worldwide. I can only assume that there are many more since. Harms to others include all those prior burdens being transmitted from the physician to other individuals, such as loved ones and colleagues. Depending on whether those affected had baseline comorbidities, the harms indeed may be significant. Although physicians have obligations of beneficence toward their patients to promote patients' interests and well-being, how far does this obligation extend? Is it an absolute ethical duty? Or is it simply a moral ideal or charitable act? At what point does the obligation to treat become supererogatory, that is, beyond the call of duty? How high must the risk be to physicians before they may permissibly refuse to intervene. In this talk, I will consider ethical arguments in favor of the duty to treat. Before we turn to those arguments, I'd like to take a brief detour through medical history. From the Black Death in Europe in 1347 to the Great Plague of London in 1665, and even yellow fever in Philadelphia in 1793, the historical record of physicians was mixed. Some doctors remained with their patients, whereas others fled for their lives. As two commentators point out, even Galen himself had admitted to fleeing from Rome when plague struck that city in 166 AD. This might have been expected, given how extraordinarily limited medicine was at the time. Discretion of such matters was left up to the individual physician. It was personal choice, a charitable act, or religious duty. An important change came with the publication of the American Medical Association's first code of ethics in 1847. The AMA exhorted, when pestilence prevails, it is physicians' duty to face the danger and to continue their labors for the alleviation of suffering, even at the jeopardy of their own lives. In the revised code of ethics in 1912, the AMA wrote, when an epidemic prevails, a physician must continue his labors for the alleviation of suffering people without regard for risk of his own health or financial return. The duty to treat was a very strong one. From 1920 through 1940, many physicians contracted and ultimately succumbed to tuberculosis by 1950, however, the risk of epidemics reduced significantly. This led to another change in the AMA's document, 
uh, to dial back the moral duty of physicians to place themselves in harm's way. During emergencies, it now proclaimed, physicians should render service to the best of their ability. Notice the contrast here with the prior versions of the code. By 1977, the AMA went so far as to remove the principle of care relating to epidemics. This change was short-lived, however, since by the 1980s, we witnessed the emergence of a new threat, HIV. With the th fear surrounding this virus and no cure in sight, some physicians and surgeons refused to treat. A renewed discussion in medicine and bioethics took place. The AMA revised their ethics code in 1987 and pronounced, a physician may not ethically refuse to treat a patient whose condition is within the physician's current realm of competence solely because the patient is HIV seropositive. Importantly, this obligation was based principally on non-discrimination toward a vulnerable group and those with a disability. For our purposes, with respect to the duty to treat, the idea was that a physician who treated an HIV positive patient would have had adequate uh, personal protective equipment, which made the risk of contracting HIV negligible. Let's fast forward to the most recent version of the AMA from 2017, which reads, a physician shall, in the provision of appropriate care, except in emergencies, be free to choose whom to serve, with whom to associate, and the environment in which to provide care. Later in the document, the AMA writes, because of their commitment to care for the sick and injured, individual physicians have an obligation to provide urgent medical care during disasters. This obligation holds even in the face of greater than usual risk to doctors' own safety, health, or life. However, they continue, the physician workforce is not an unlimited resource. Therefore, when providing care in a disaster with its inherent dangers, doctors also have an obligation to evaluate the risks of providing care to individual patients versus the need to be available to provide care in the future. Finally, the AMA writes, physicians have a further responsibility to protect their own health to ensure that they remain able to provide care. One can see from these statements how the AMA position on the topic has evolved, or you might even think devolved. Paradoxically, the duty to treat is weaker now than it was when physicians had much more rudimentary means of intervening. Significant discretion is vested in the hands of physicians. They may choose whom to serve unless it is an emergency or disaster situation. Does COVID constitute such an emergency or disaster scenario? If the answer is yes, does this mean that all doctors would not be permitted ethically to refuse to treat? Or does it mean that certain kinds of doctors, such as primary care physicians, ER doctors, surgeons, pulmonologists who need to intubate patients with COVID, and infectious disease specialists. Does this mean that they would not be permitted to refuse to treat, but others would be granted such accommodation? Do we want to make distinctions among different types of physician? In the next section, I will argue that there is a strong obligation for physicians to treat, even if this means that they are placed at elevated risk of personal harm. This generally means that it would be impermissible from a moral perspective for physicians to refrain from treating the sick. As a preliminary consideration, I would like to explore what's called minimally decent Samaritanism. The general ethical rule here is that you should try to help uh, or rescue a stranger if you are in a position to do so. There is little cost to you and the risks are not significant. However, you would not be required to intervene if the risks or cost to you are significant. So if a child is drowning, relatively close to the beach, and you know how to swim and can intervene fairly easily, you are obligated on this view to intervene. This obligation would be less strict and perhaps even supererogatory if we change the details such that the risk to self is greater and your ability to actually save the child is less secure. For example, imagine the same child is playing ice hockey on a lake in my own home state of Massachusetts, 
the child falls through the ice in the middle of the lake and you happen to be walking nearby but are 200 feet away, we might say you have an obligation to call for more expert help, but you do not have an obligation to step onto thin ice in the middle of the lake to attempt a rescue. Now, like all human beings, doctors are obligated ethically to be minimally decent Samaritans towards strangers. However, unlike other human beings, physicians were educated, trained, and hired by hospitals specifically to care for a particular kind of stranger in need, namely patients. Therefore, when it comes to helping and rescuing patients, doctors have a stricter and more demanding duty to their patients than non-physicians have to strangers. Physicians, in other words, have a role-based duty to treat, and they must assume more risk or burden when trying to rescue their patients. What grounds this duty of the physician to treat and accept this elevated risk of harm? There are many possibilities here, and I would like to focus on three of them. Implied consent, reciprocity, and the nature of medicine as a healing enterprise. Let's look first at implied consent. There is something to the idea that joining a particular occupation implies certain things about its members. Imagine the lifeguard who refuses to save the swimmer from drowning. Imagine the police officer who declines to respond to a particular violent incident in downtown Los Angeles. Imagine the firefighter who declines to assist during efforts to contain the bobcat fire, for example. One might say that if such individuals aren't willing to do what their job ordinarily requires, perhaps they shouldn't have signed up for that occupation in the first place. After all, if one decides to become a lifeguard, police officer, or firefighter, one can certainly foresee certain events occurring that require some type of intervention. Physicians, it would seem, are no different in this regard. I do not mean to minimize the risk to physicians during COVID, but I would like to point out that other professionals also put their lives on the line every day. These individuals also have families. They also have responsibilities to others. Consider firefighters, for example. There were 64 on-duty firefighter fatalities in the United States two years ago. Firefighters also face many serious injuries while on duty. In 2016, there were more than 60,000 reported injuries, including more than 9,000 documented exposures to infectious diseases, such as hepatitis, meningitis, HIV, 36,000 documented exposures to hazardous conditions, such as asbestos, chemicals, fumes, and radioactive materials, and 15,000 collisions involving fire department emergency vehicles who were responding to incidents. To briefly summarize, the obligation to care for the sick entails certain basic commitments on the part of the physician. Through their decision to become a member of a healing profession, physicians, one could argue, implicitly agree to put themselves in harm's way, at least a minimum level of harm in order to secure the patient's well-being. One can argue that this implicit agreement is stronger in the case of particular specialists, such as infectious disease physicians. I'd like to move now to the question of reciprocity. What can society at large justly expect from its physicians? After all, society invests heavily in medicine by subsidizing the education and training of its future healers. Sorry, my light just went off in my office. <laughs> um, Monopoly-like powers are granted to the profession. Licensure creates barriers to entry, minimizes competition, and helps ensure higher incomes. Physicians also enjoy high social status. Is society owed anything in return? The concept of reciprocity gets at this issue. Similar to how society has invested in its doctors, doctors too should repay this investment somehow. There are reciprocal obligations. Moreover, as some commentators have pointed out, medical doctors have consumed a scarce good by taking a place in a medical school class that could have gone to someone who was willing to accept the duty to treat. I believe that there is a reasonable expectation that physicians should intervene during a pandemic in some cases, this might mean that physicians will have to work more hours 
or even treat patients outside of their specialty. That said, I think this reasonable expectation of physicians will be lessened to the extent that personal protective equipment is unavailable or suboptimal at the time the physician is performing the exam. Society has a concomitant responsibility to ensure the provision of adequate PPE. As one commentator has argued, um, in the absence of adequate PPE, there is no duty to treat. I think this stance is too strong. Physicians until very recently lacked sophisticated ways of protecting themselves when they cared for infectious patients. Moreover, if physicians refuse to intervene, who will care for these patients? <coughs> I'm going to move now to the third um, possible basis for this duty to treat, which is the nature of medicine as a healing enterprise. Whether or not physicians may refuse to treat highly infectious patients is going to be based, at least in part, on our conception of medicine. Is medicine similar to other kinds of occupation? Is it simply contractual? Or is there something more fundamental at play? The late Edmund Pellegrino has argued that medicine is not an ordinary occupation. It is a moral endeavor and its practitioners form a moral community. In the context of epidemics, he holds that there is an obligation of effacement of self-interest on the part of the physician for three reasons. First, the nature of illness and the need for healing create a moral claim on those equipped to help. Second, Medical knowledge is non-proprietary. In Pellegrino's estimation, the physician's knowledge is not individually owned and ought not to be used primarily for personal gain, prestige, or power. Rather, the physician holds this knowledge in trust for the good of the sick. Third, the physician takes a public oath of fidelity to be dedicated to the patient's interests. Thus, on Pellegrino's view, the ethical duties of physicians are grounded in the beneficence-based nature of medicine as a healing practice. Allow me to conclude this section with an interesting piece of, Pel of Pellegrino trivia. Back in 2006 at the President's Council on Bioethics, where I was on staff at the time, our group was sharing lunch together. We discussed which book we would take with us if we were forced to live on an isolated island. Pellegrino's choice, the Plague by Camus. If you haven't read it, you should. It offers an incredible account of the virtuous physician who puts himself in harm's way to safeguard the good of his patient. I'm now going to conclude. Um, so where does all of this leave us? I have argued that physicians have a moral duty to treat patients during COVID. This is due in part to their education, training, expertise, and ability to intervene. Society, I think, also has a reasonable expectation that physicians intervene. One can argue, based on implied consent, that this obligation should be stronger in light of the physician's specialty. Compare infectious disease specialists with, say, radiologists. One could also argue, based on reciprocity, that the obligation to treat will be weaker to the extent that adequate PPE is unavailable. Society in general, and health institutions in particular have correlative obligations to physicians in terms of supplying PPE. The duty to treat is not absolute, however. There are limits to what the profession of medicine or society can demand of its healers. One needs to factor the likelihood and magnitude of the harm to the doctor. Here, an analogy with firefighting might be helpful. Firefighters have obligations to try to rescue people trapped in burning buildings, for example, but this duty wanes when the, question, when the building in question is so consumed that it probably will collapse when the firefighter is inside. The firefighter who chooses to enter anyway is a hero. The action itself, however, is beyond the call of duty. Similarly, in the context of COVID, I would argue that the duty to treat will be weaker for those physicians who themselves have serious enough comorbidities that place them at a high risk of a bad outcome if they succumb to the illness. Part of the reason is that the physician also has duties to treat future patients. The other reason is that the physician's colleagues 
will have to shoulder additional burden if the initial physician were no longer able to practice. I remain less confident about this weakened duty if we change the details such that it is not the treating physician, but say a family member of the physician who has serious comorbidities. I'll have to save that for another talk. There is a final limitation on the duty to treat, which has to do with what legitimately may be requested by patients or their surrogates. Patients do not have the right to receive futile intervention. COVID patients who are so unlikely to benefit from ICU transfer, mechanical intubation, ECMO support, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation should not have these interventions started or performed. That said, optimal palliative management of the dying patient becomes key. Although the ICU attending's obligation might be to refrain from intervening, judge that is in light of the patient's overwhelmingly poor prognosis, this does not mean that the patient should be abandoned. Palliative care must remain available to ensure a peaceful dying process. I conclude with a final quote from Pellegrino and Thomas Ma. The doctor is the patient's last safeguard. To abandon that role is to defect from what medicine is about, the use of knowledge to help, heal, cure, and care for persons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rejo, for your engaging and I would say even provocative uh, presentation. Um, I want to say that your presentation honors the memory of those who have died of healthcare professionals who have died in uh, carrying out their duty to uh, provide care to patients in all these months. And there have been many indeed. I pass to the uh, last panelist who is uh, Dr. Gigi McMillan. Uh, Dr. McMillan uh, received her uh, doctoral degree at the University of Loyola Chicago, and she is currently the program administrator for our Bioethics Institute. Uh, here at the Institute, she also teaches courses in the area of research ethics. Um, her commitment to research ethics is one that has led her to important positions nationally. Uh, among others, the board of directors for PRIMER, the Public Responsibility Medicine and Research, the Pediatric Advisory Committee for the FDA and others. Um, she will be discussing questions of research ethics in the pandemic. Dr. McMillan. Great, thank you, Dr. DeLauro. I'm Happy to be here this evening and have greatly enjoyed the presentation so far. Thank you, Dr. Brown and Dr. Rejo. Uh, first, I'm going to give a brief overview of what constitutes ethical research. And then I'll identify a few research issues that are particular to the pandemic and suggest ways that existing best practices might apply to these issues. And then finally, we'll look at creative paths for future research. Now, this pandemic highlights a perceived conflict between scientific rigor in drug development and acute public health emergency. Different stakeholders, the public, governments, the scientific community, patients, research subjects, drug developers, they all bring their own perspectives and priorities. There are a lot of voices and they are all talking loudly. Uh, in the face of the urgency of the COVID-19 crisis, we need to remember that the cornerstones of research ethics still hold respect for persons, also referred to as autonomy, beneficence, and justice. The notion of autonomy is more than just deciding for oneself. It is having enough data to make an informed, an informed decision. To iterate before a research participant decides to join a study, they need accurate, current, and understandable information about what will happen to them. Beneficence refers to doing good. In clinical care, this means what is good for the individual patient. In a research context, this refers to meaningful contribution to scientific knowledge or the potential benefit 
outweighs the potential harms. Finally, justice in healthcare typically refers to access to medical care and allocation of resources. The just involvement of humans in research not only includes equitable distribution of risk and benefit among study populations, but also using the best scientific data and methodology available. These principles are the foundation for a rigorous system of phased clinical trials, which build safety and efficacy step by step. But this is a painstaking process that stretches over months and years. As we suffer from contagion of this coronavirus, the acute and long-term health implications and alarming mortality rate, the randomized clinical trial gold standard seems an obstacle to speedy anti-coronavirus vaccine and successful therapeutics. The dire circumstances of the pandemic inspire compassion for the suffering and dying and anxious desire to spring into action. But this new situation does not mean we need new rules. The old rules, our existing tradition of ethical research practice, are still valid and in some ways even more important given the magnitude of potential harm and ethical dilemmas that we face as we address this global emergency. Now let's look at some characteristics particular to the pandemic. There are many important issues involving COVID-19 research, but I will speak about four of them. The public sense of urgency, allocation of resources, vulnerable subject populations, and access to the interventions produced by clinical trials. Not always, but usually when a person considers participation in research, it is framed within familiar parameters, a known disease with some history of treatment, the subject is focused on their own personal experience and individual outcomes, and there is some confidence in the current amount of knowledge and expertise. The COVID-19 emergency, however, presents an unknown disease appearing for the first time in humans. Information and access to it changes frequently. There are conflicting opinions about what the right action is to take. The title of expert is awarded and revoked on a daily basis. A personal decision to participate in research now has dramatic societal implications. And there is overwhelming public and political discourse and significant individual and public emotional distress. You can imagine how the already difficult process of deciding whether to participate in a research study is compounded by these factors. Researchers all over the world have begun working on preventative measures and treatment for COVID-19. As of Monday this week, there were 2,388 registered trials and more than 500,000 subjects enrolled. This means that resources that would have been dedicated to other health issues and other research questions have been redirected. And in some cases, studies already in progress have been shut down. Now note, when I refer to resources, I mean more than just funding. I include investigator time and effort, the use of physical infrastructure, repurposing of existing drugs, and importantly, the health, well-being, and burdens borne by subjects who participate in these studies or who request, request and receive treatments not yet proven effective. An example of this, of course, is the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, both FDA approved to treat or prevent malaria. Hydroxychloroquine is also approved to treat autoimmune conditions such as chronic and systemic lupus in adults and rheumatoid arthritis. On March 28th, the FDA granted emergency use authorization of these agents to treat COVID-19 but it revoked it on June 15th based on new scientific benefit risk data, suggesting that this regimen was unlikely an effective treatment. The public healthcare providers and the scientific community were dismayed by lost time and resources. This incident raised many issues, including this kind of emergency use does not require data collection, ineffective unproven therapies if approved for use, may displace more effective therapies or hinder eligibility to, to participate in other studies. 
Enthusiasm for chloroquine led to shortages for autoimmune disease treatment where it is proven. And in normal circumstances, chloroquine is associated with life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias and thus contraindicated for COVID-19 patients whom, as time went on, we learned could frequently develop virus-related cardiac issues. These problems reflect ethical dimensions related to compelling and valid science, resource allocation, dissemination of accurate information, cogent methodology in clinical research, avoidance of harm, and maximization of benefit. Even as we move forward with well-planned studies, there are ethical implications about who should be recruited to treatment and vaccine trials. For example, as a rule, we do not like to involve children in experiments where there is no prospect for direct benefit. This has, in general, led to research practices that focus on adult subjects in the beginning stages and trickle down to the pediatric population in later stages when more is known about the investigative agent. With COVID-19, however, while children might not be as seriously affected health-wise as the rest of the population, they are certainly carriers. So at what point is it necessary to include them in vaccine trials in order to answer important public health questions? Another issue directly involves just distribution of risk and benefit. Best research practices avoid enrolling at-risk populations in exploitative numbers. The intent here is to keep one particular community of subjects from bearing the majority of the risk while the rest of society benefits. But how then do we ethically address the racial, ethnic, and economic profiles that are disproportionately represented in the infection and death rates of this coronavirus? On the one hand, this population's immediately, immediate daily health risks need to be addressed. On the other hand, we don't want to over-enroll an already burdened demographic. These are questions that need transparent and frank discussion. Finally, it is one thing to identify a safe vaccine. It is another to distribute it. Let's just talk about our own country for a moment. There are more than 300 million people in the United States. Imagine the logistics of producing millions of vials of vaccine distributing them, keeping track of who gets what. And remember, it's possible that the vaccine will require two doses to be effective. And we don't yet know how long immunity will last. Clearly, the supply will not be available all at once, and it will take time to build distribution pathways. So who gets it first and who decides? Who owns the vaccine? How much does it cost? What is acceptable profit? When we frame these questions within a global context, the complexity is even more mind boggling. Now, I personally get annoyed when people talk about provocative problems, but don't bother to suggest answers. Uh, so I expect my closing comments will be mildly irritating, but I hope to make some important points. My soundbite takeaway is the COVID-19 pandemic is new but best practices for ethical research are not. The principles of autonomy, beneficence, and justice offer an excellent framework for evaluating some troubling issues. I'm going to focus on autonomy and justice since I think these are a little harder to get one's brain around when thinking about pandemic research. Um, the principle of respect for persons or autonomy with regards to any research requires accurate and up-to-date information so that a person can decide if they want to participate in a study. Two important aspects of this are the quality of the information and the understanding of research risks. There should be a centralized, politically neutral clearinghouse for COVID-19 related data. This central authority would define the terms and the data sets so that the information could be intelligently evaluated and reported to the public. In saner times, this would be the CDC, and qualified experts would vet, sort, and update meaningful statistics in a consistent, rational, and accessible way. 
The reason this is so important is related to the second point, which is that the general public, who all of potential subjects for pandemic research, need to understand the risks of the disease and of the research. In many instances, and some scholars say that in most instances, people are not, research studies are not designed for their personal benefit. Clinical trials are designed to gather information for the benefit of future patients. That is the nature of research. We are doing an experiment because we don't know how well the new drug or treatment will work. If we already knew the answer, it would be a standard of care treatment and not a research question. While it is always important for a subject to have accurate information, pandemic research dealing with so many unknowns that transparency and detailed attention is especially important to meet the ethical standards for informed consent. It may be that this global health emergency requires taking greater risks with research than the scientific community and society in general would normally be comfortable with, but it is not unethical to do so as long as the subjects fully understand what they are getting into. Now, when I think of justice and COVID-19 research, I think of allocation of resources and creative methodologies. Yes, this is a global health emergency and the sense of urgency that we all feel is valid, but the answer is not to skip steps to, go, to work faster. It is to leverage our existing resources and work smarter. Regional and international collaborative efforts should be the norm, not the exception. Innovative science can include that adapt new data or share control arms across multiple protocols. For example, if you would forgive a gross oversimplification, optimized clinical trial for vaccines, you might have two groups of similar subjects. And one of them is composed of the people who, by chance, were assigned to receive a vaccine. And the other group is made up of people who, by chance, were assigned to not. The group who does not get the vaccine is the control group, the normals. The study would follow both groups to see if the experimental vaccine was effective in preventing COVID-19. Now, there are many different vaccines being tested right now, and most of them have their own control groups. A creative way to move faster would be to have all the vaccines compared against the same control group instead of many duplicate ones. And additionally, this would minimize the number of subjects enrolled in non-treatment arms of study. This would require coordination among many different parties to make sure that the study groups were alike and that the same efficacy measurements were being used. It would take planning, collaboration, sharing of data, a single review board, uh, and, uh, and humility on the part of all the stakeholders. This is an illustration of how a multi-phase process might be streamlined without sacrificing scientific validity. And there are many other innovative trial designs that deserve attention as well. So my time is up. Uh, in summary, yes, the pandemic is a serious health emergency, but panic is not the answer. People are sick, people are dying. This is not an excuse to be imprudent because people are sick and dying in normal times from many diseases. Perhaps we should think about it this way. The fact that so many people are sick and dying right now from an unknown disease is a good reason to be careful. Like I said, my soundbite takeaway is the COVID-19 pandemic is new, but best practices for ethical research are not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McMillan, uh, for the very pithy presentation of the uh, many, many questions involved in the uh, ethics of research um, at this point. Um, I think your conclusions are not uh, soundbite-like at all. You have proposed very, very serious uh, reflections and criteria I want to uh, at the end of this wonderful event. Uh, thank all of you for your participation. Of course, thank especially the three panelists, Dr. Brown, Dr. Rejo, Dr. McMillan for their interventions. 
Uh, as Dr. McMillan uh, announced, uh, it looks like we are going to have to repeat uh, this, uh, this particular uh, event, that the topic of facing disaster uh, will probably be one we will be in fact facing other times in the future. But for now, I believe we have gotten uh, a number of insights and we will certainly treasure them. Thank you uh, everyone for your participation and I wish you all a good evening. Great. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you very much.